Well, good morning, everybody. Um, General Carlisle sends his uh, regrets. He wished he could be here and had attended to, but uh, for scheduling reasons beyond his control, you get me instead. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. You go from the ultimate noble statesman to um, an adequate caveman is probably the best way to call me. Uh, and for that, I'm sorry. Uh, what I didn't know, as Dr. Fender said, here's some of the prep over the last couple of weeks getting ready for this, is that I would be following the congressman and in front of the Secretary of the Navy, uh, again, making this even more uncomfortable for me. But uh, to the congressman, thank you for those comments. We'll get at some of the questions that were asked uh, and, and continue to uh, provide information for those, so that was great. Um, also, uh, the Honorable Frank Kendall is attending the, the event, and his leadership and ATNL at the OSD level is the team that really is pushing forward with some of their initiatives to make sure that, that we do spend some of the money that we need in the right systems and directed energy as part of that. Uh, to give us the opportunity to save money in other areas that are significant. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, General Heithold sitting on the front row, uh, one of our Air Force warfighters uh, in charge of ASSOC Command, uh, and also General Edder sitting right down here. Uh, these are two of the statesmen you'll hear from in a little bit that give you the opportunity to say we do have capability that we can uh, process and attempt some of the, uh, the efforts that are ongoing and make sure that we are putting directed energy into the warfighters' hands, and uh, that's a big part of what we're here for today. I'd also like to extend a thanks from General Carlisle for the industry that's attending. Uh, the fact that you are bringing your research to us, uh, one of the things we're going to strive to do throughout the day is understand better as a warfighter what our perspectives are to bridge that gap of what industry has and in getting that into production. So just through the prototyping and into uh, what we need as a warfighter at the right numbers in the front lines. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're doing today. So that's the partnership between our combat air forces and our science and technology community, both the labs and private industry, so that we can maintain our, our dominant uh, position in air, space, and cyberspace. Through the partnerships, um, let's see, today in the global strategic environment, it's a incre uh, incredibly complex and unpredictable, uh, and it presents a wide variety of opportunities, challenges, and threats to the United States and the international community. The environment also creates opportunities for us in the form of evolving alliances and new technologies. But anytime you have any of those challenges, the opportunities out there generally can outweigh the, the funding needed to make sure that we are able to act. Air superiority is a critical precondition to our successful military operations. Without air superiority, you not only lose the battle in the air, but you also lose the battle on the surface. Forces, the emerging air-to-air -air and surface-to-air threats in the uh, aging fleet we have have reduced uh, our Air Force's current air superiority advantage in the highly contested threat environments that we're facing. But we all know that resources are limited, as we talked about and heard about sequestration, sequestration already today. Yet the Air Force must leverage all our current and future opportunities for research and development to focus on our advancing and our most critical capability shortfalls. We need to take the asymmetric advantages that are, grant our warfighters the survivability, lethality, and persistence. Right now, when we talk about an air-to-air -air engagement, we measure it in miles and minutes on who gets that first shot opportunity. With directed energy, you change that to milliseconds and seconds and it's not who gets the first shot opportunity, it's who sees who first. So stealth will continue to play an advantage, and we have worked well with the community in the past, but directed energy gives you that opportunity to be much more lethal. We cannot afford the incremental improvements. We need innovation and game changers that enable the revolutionary technologies to address the future fight. We also need to reverse that cost equation. As you heard earlier, shooting a $500,000 missile at a $500 threat coming in is not a great way to do that. We will always have more mission, time, or money than we can get at with the people that we have and the resources we've been given. So we're going to have to respond to the prolifer proliferation of these inexpensive lethal threats without needlessly endangering the airmen or bankrupting the force. Some of our potential adversaries are near peers. We can apply the same principles to respond to their expensive warheads and weapons with reusable DE countermeasures. As you've heard, the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory scientists calculate that about a liter of fuel 
is what it costs to fire and cool an electronic airborne laser uh, that can defend against the hardest adversary surface-to-air and air-to-air -air missiles. Those missiles cost our adversaries millions of dollars to make. For the price of another liter of fuel, we can then fire that same weapon at the next threat that's inbound. That is a game changer, where now we are spending dollars to, to defeat millions of dollars of the weapons coming at us. Not only is it economical, but it's also fast. 67 milliseconds to travel halfway around the world, that is the game changer that General Carlisle is trying to bring into this arena. Slide five. I'm sure to some of you that all this sounds like science fiction, but the reality is we have 40 years of successful high energy laser technology tests and demonstrators. In 1973, the Air Force team at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico shot down a drone with a carbon dioxide laser. In 1984, an Air Force team above a C, or in a C-135 destroyed an AIM-9 missile and a cruise missile in flight. In 2009, AFSOC's Airborne Advanced Tactical Laser successfully targeted and stopped multiple trucks. In 2010, the Airborne Laser, which we have mothballed, uh, destroyed a ballistic missile in the boost phase with, within two minutes of launch. That was tracking and pointing with impressive precision. Slide. Some of the most promising current directed energy weapon system enablers include DARPA's high energy liquid, high energy liquid laser area defense system, HELADS for short, which is an incredible 150 kilowatt class laser, solid state. The counter electronics high power microwave uh, is a microwave system capable of targeting destroying electronic systems with minimal collateral damage. The Air Force Research Laboratory's active denial system transmit millimeter wave energy that is absorbed by the skin surface, producing a rapid and dramatic temperature rise in about a quarter of a second that provides a, an automatic get out of the way response, regardless of your rank. Additionally, <laughs> I was not the volunteer. <laughs> Additionally, AFRL is committed to a $500 million laser weapon system with initial flights in FY18 and 19. Slide seven. Very near term potential applications of the directed energy are homeland and air base defense, which you'll hear more about today from General Eder. He's the commander of AFNORTH, uh, and he is in, uh, considering laser and high power microwave capabilities to defend his threats. That's the defense of our homeland. Now, I don't want to steal his thunder, but using directed energy to create our own anti-access aerial denial system, as many of our adversaries are doing to us, could realize a tremendous reduction in the cost per shot for our nation. But there are challenges ahead. The promise of directed energy is clear, but we've been talking about this for more than a decade and demonstrating it at some levels. First, government and industry partnership are essential for rapid tech development and fielding of new capabilities. The Air Force has a long history of developing asymmetric advantages through partnership with industry. You've heard some of those talked about today. Aerial refueling is another one, in addition to the advanced radar and the stealth systems. They all resulted in collaboration with Air Force and the industry. In an effort to get back to this model, the Air Force is reinvigorating our developmental planning and experimentation effort. The goal is rapid prototyping with both virtual and hardware confirmed transitions to program offices. In the audience today, we have Brigadier General Eric Fix sitting right here. Uh, he is our PEO for fighters and bombers, and he's eager to assist uh, if you have those technologies that are ready to demonstrate. At the same time, technology is only half of the solution. We also need to look at the concept of employment, the concept of operations, the TTPs, which are the tactic, techniques, and procedures, doctrine, and policy. Recently, the Air Force has stood up an air superiority enterprise collaborate, collaborate, Capabilities Collaboration Team. They are looking at air security in the future and the concepts across multiple domains in air, cyber, and space for how we develop the required capabilities with sufficient capacity to meet our nation's needs. For the first time, there is a place to bring technically feasible, operationally relevant emerging technologies, directed energy, into the warfighter and on the platforms. And that brings me to my next point. It's past the time to have these as demonstrators. Let's get them out into the field. We need the operators involved, so you have some of those cavemen here with you today. Modeling and simulation can only do so much. 
So we need to test the performance in an operationally relevant environment so we can start developing those CONOPs and work with Congress to get changes in the policies and OSD that are required to make this happen. The Air Force is stepping forward to provide range, platform, and human resources. We are asking industry to provide the innovative technology and the people to join our teams. Today we use directed energy to guide weapons. Tomorrow, directed energy can be those weapons. Slide. The ability to provide dominant combat air power underpins our nation's ability to pursue and protect its vital interests. Without it, other military operations and instruments of power become less creditable. Directed energy weapons will enhance our ability to provide that dominant combat air power, offering flexibility, lethality, and persistence while reversing the cost equation. Given the near-term threats and the current opportunities, we depend on our partnerships and collaboration with industry as well as within the government to ensure continued U.S. dominance. Slide. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention today. At this time, I'll open up for further questions. Uh, James Drew, Flight Global. Could you talk to us about um, Air Combat Command's view of the CHAMP weapon system um, and whether you have a way to bring this out of the lab as AFRL says it's ready to, to come out of the lab and turn it into a uh, operational weapon system? In an unclassified format, you can't say too much about that other than we recognize some of the capabilities, uh, but until we work it into our normal war plans, uh, we are still trying to study how that weapon system would impact uh, some of the threats that we're looking at and the missions that we're given. So yes, we are looking at that. We think that it will come out and be a viable weapon in the future, uh, and we're continuing to bridge that gap from just technology uh, to bring it out into production for the warfighter's hands. I can't say much more than that unclassified. Uh, I'd have to talk to my eight team. That was my last job, uh, but I know that the half eight sitting in the audience, that's something we can discuss with them uh, in the break as soon as we, uh, we step out of here. Thank you. So. You know, the Army and Navy efforts are very much in the counter artillery, counter drone, missile defense area, but what I hear from you and AFRL seems like it's more offensively focused. So, and of course, you also have a very diff different challenge fitting this on an aircraft, even a, you know, an AC-130 type aircraft, let alone uh, a fighter aircraft. So, you know, distinguish your efforts in this field and the tactical possibilities for the Air Force from the uh, kind of weapons that the uh, surface services, as it were, are developing. Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say we are broad, broadening the spectrum. It will be used in, in an air, air defense is what we're seeing from First Air Force and the discussions are here later today that it'll be part of that counter missile and threat defense that we are uh, having to defend against now. But in addition, we do have gunships uh, that, that I think the general is planning to retire that we're going to hold on to for longer so that are active and available to test in the, in the form of the C-130. So. Um, that would be used more in the, uh, I, I wouldn't say an offensive role or the Department of Defense, but to use in our war plans and our current engagements, it's not necessarily just to defend against weapons being shot at it, but use it as a weapon in outright. Uh, and once we get this sized right, we have right now targeting pods that are fairly small that produce lasers uh, for guiding weapons. Uh, if we're able to put it into a, another pod along that line, uh, or put it internal to future fighters or some of the current fighters that have weapons bays that are internal and we can fit the size, weight, and power. I, I think directed energy would be used counter weapons against the weapons coming at us, but also used to go after the shooter. Uh, if I can disable the radar that's guiding those weapons in a fighter platform, uh, if I can disable some of the hardware associated with that in the computers, the electronic uh, the, the cards that are associated with that, uh, then it's not technically an offensive weapon because it's still uh, us going out to achieve our objectives, but, but use it to go after the shooter rather than just the individual weapons coming our way. Yes, sir. Bill Sweetman of Aviation Week. Um, can you give us a little more detail on the, um, on the air defense application and uh, homeland defense application? And um, how is that being meshed in with um, Army and Navy work on surface, surface launched, surface fired lasers. Outstanding. Uh, another great question. In a homeland defense, in a counter um, 
weapon role, what we see is one of the hardest things we have to do is to be able to identify the targets that are coming at us to know are they friendly, uh, is, is it just truly a target of interest that we just need to identify, uh, or a, a weapon that we need to employ against. Directed energy has possibilities in a non-lethal role to help identify what that threat is, to classify that for us, uh, and then a different system or scaling up the same system to actually act uh, target it, whether it's you're going after the electronics that are guiding it uh, or you're going for a um, what you might call a, um, a firepower kill where you destroy the warhead that might be associated with that or the, the thrust or the engine what's providing it that, um, that, that movement. Uh, lots of ways to look at that and the field is quite wide open. So uh, we see the use for directed energy to be all the way from a non-lethal to a very lethal uh, weapon force. Yeah, you're speaking a lot, and everybody here is speaking a lot about the technology, but as you transition from the labs to the operational community, what about the people and the skill sets that you need to make this happen? Where are you going to develop that? Where is it going to come from? Well, thankful, uh, most of the services, uh, and certainly the Air Force, we put our people first, and we have some of the brightest technicians uh, and operators that, that are on the planet, so I think we already have them resident. Uh, w as I said, we're employing lasers on a daily basis. We've been using them for 20 plus years, guiding our precision weapons to take the next step and now make it the actual weapon. Uh, we have that, cap that capability, both on the maintenance and the operational side, so is uh, the scientists and the researchers are able to provide us with those demonstration models. We'll figure out what works, then we have to go have our planners write that into the, the plan itself so we have the operations concept uh, of how to use that and then it becomes how we train to it. So it, it's just clearly the next step of, of a process. So I think we already have that one answered fairly well. We've got a lot of bright people in the Air Force. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. General, I um, wanted to ask you to follow up on the gunship issue, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. And then, given the lead time it takes to integrate weapons into systems like the F-35, you know, we understand that there are, you're already making decisions now on what's going to be in the next in the Block 4 upgrades for the F-35. Is there any possibility that any of what you're showing us and talking to us could be included in the sort of first set of upgrades for the F-35? And then if you just elaborate on the gunships, which gunships are you going to keep? What are you going to do with them? What is that? The ones we're keeping, uh, and actually I'll leave that for the expert. He'll he'll be happy to answer that question here in a little bit when he's on stage. But um, we have a requirement for a minimum number of gunships, and we are trying to afford new C-130Js to replace all of those because we're not achieving that. We have some additional U models that we had intended to fly or intended to retire that will be flying longer, and, and those could be some of our flying test beds. When it comes to integrating this in the F-35, uh, basically we have to have that technology in our hands before we can even figure out where do we start with that. So if it, uh, for the F-35 being an LO airplane, it, it needs to come out of a certain aperture and, and not change the overall capability of the, uh, the stealthiness of that airplane. So our approach to that will be it probably won't make block four, uh, it, but there are opportunities for it. And the ECCT that I spoke about, that collaboration team, they're looking at future follow-on generations. But again, uh, whether this worked its way into a block, uh, I'm sorry, a, a fourth generation or a legacy platform. Uh, we have an F-15E that is an extremely capable airplane that has power to spare that if we mounted this inside maybe a conformal tank or external on a, uh, uh, a pod like it's flying with the, the sniper pods now, uh, it, it's available right now for, for that effort. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Lee Jung Greco with Inside the Air Force. Uh, going back to those potted demonstrations, does the Air Force have a timeline of when they plan to do those? The potted demonstrations? Yes. Uh, again, uh, I'd have to ask specifically which ones. We are moving forward with uh, directed energy in the ATD, but if it's a pod that industry is bringing forward to us, um, we will work, we, we have a, an organization that is prepared to accept that now and to start uh, providing the flying hours and the, the range space, the things we need to go out and test that. So it, it's available now, we are, we're just waiting on the hardware from that perspective. James Drew Flight Global ask another one. Um, uh, the Air Force Research Lab, uh, you know, led the way with the active denial system. Um, what airborne applications might you have for that weapon system? 
um, and, and have you started thinking about any requirements for that? Uh, certainly we have. Uh, whether it's in a coin environment like today's fight that we're going on, if we have a group that's massing uh, that we need to disperse, right now my option is to, to do a sound flyby uh, and, and literally a, what we call a show of presence or show of force uh, and make a lot of noise with the jet noise. But that uses a lot of gas. Uh, for a leader or two, we might be able to go out and, and disperse that crowd using that um, aerial denial weapon. Uh, I have not felt it myself, but as I understand it, as soon as it hits you within that quarter second, you are moving and stopping what you're doing, and it's uh, an autonomous uh, or an automated type of a, a reaction. So uh, I could see that being on some of our UAV platforms or some of our gunships that are circling the area to, to disperse a crowd in a non-lethal manner and to change the situation and scenario. So uh, there are applications we could use immediately for, for that effort. Again, thank you for your time. Uh, we look forward to, to taking it from a warfighter's perspective, the, the things that you're bringing forward and the technology, the demonstrations, and, and the ideas that you have and putting those on our airplanes and testing those. So uh, we've been doing it for a while. As you saw back in the 70s and 80s, we have uh, actually had laser systems mounted on our airplanes that we're using. We'll continue to work forward for that. and. What we're looking for is an economical advantage. It will cost money to get there, uh, but the team has assured us that we are spending so much money right now to buy those missiles at 500 and, and a million a pop that if I can get to a weapon system that allows me to have that magazine that I can stay longer uh, and continue to fire and just put new gas in the airplane and it is a full reload rather than just to have to land, put more weapons on it you're opening up the capabilities for us. So both the speed of directed energy coming to the warfighter and the speed of it being employed where it's moving 186,000 miles a second, it changes what we're doing and that's what we're looking for. So again, thanks for your time and I look forward to spending the next day here with industry. Thanks.